Yes, we are back, and we're going to be looking at another game from chess history, focusing on one guy who came up with something interesting. Um, now, this was in turn of the century, 1899-1900, according to the date on the game, in Vienna. And we've got Adolf Schwartz playing white and... Adolf Alban playing black. The most famous thing about the Romanian chess player, uh, Mr. Alban, he's best known for the counter gambit that bears his name. Like, uh, overall with his career, it was pretty spotty with serious tournament play because he didn't start competing in tournaments until he's 40, which is, you know, quite old, especially by today's standards. I mean, Look at Keanu. I mean, he's like 12 or something. <laughs> so, uh, the thing about this guy, though, he may have not had the best, like, tournament results overall, but on a game-by-game -game basis, he could play some serious strong chess because he did have a win over the world champion at the time, which was the first world champion recognized by Fide Wilhelm Steinitz. So, let's break it down. D4, D5, C4. Now, this is called the Queen's Gambit. Now, we defined what a gambit is before. A gambit is giving up material for time. Remember, there are three advantages in chess. Time, material, quality. We all understand material. I got more guys, it's easier to win. Like, that's why we worked on overkill checkmates. But then, a lot of people mess up that concept of the interplay of advantages. If I give you a pawn right now, but I get two moves in return for that pawn, that's two extra moves to attack you with. So it may be worth the risk to some players to give up the material to get the time. In this case, if black grabs the pawn, white can take the whole center. And remember one of our principles we discussed of a good opening. I always do this with my beginner players. Maintain a pawn in the center. That way your pieces don't get kicked around as easy. Develop your knights and bishops effectively and castle. Did black maintain a pawn in the center? This is called Queen's Gambit accepted. Well, Mr. Albin, he came up with a very particular idea. White is throwing Queen's Gambit at you, so he goes, well, I'm going to up the ante. I'm going to play a counter gambit. I'm going to offer you a pawn. So... He came up with it, so it's named after him, the Albin Counter Gambit. Now, White goes, you know what? There's lots of pawns to take. I'm going to grab it. So instead of just taking back immediately here, which would trade queens and White's just up a pawn, Black keeps the tension. He pushes by. Now, the key with this move is it takes away the ability of White to develop to that normal square. So for the price of a pawn... He's making it just a little bit awkward for white to develop. And even though this game was played, you know, 120 years ago, the quality of play by black, when I checked it over with the engine, was actually quite solid. And the engines, they hate counter gambits for the most part. Like right now, the computer's like white's like a full point up. And remember how the point system works. Pawn is one. Knight and bishop three, rook is five, queen is nine. And we've also talked about before how uh, the scale isn't exactly like solid to follow, but that's how engines, that's how their evaluation goes. So one of those notes that you could possibly have is, how does an ev engine evaluate a position? What does the number mean? Number is based off a of piece value. That could be a question, just throwing that out there. All right, so. After d4, white goes, well, I got to develop, so he pushes his pawn up. Black secures his pawn in the center, and white does something that I cannot agree with. Notice how so far, white has only made pawn moves in the game where I'll move five. If you think about the good openings that I've shown you guys in the past, typically it's like two, maybe maximum three pawn moves, and the rest is peace moves and castling. White's really testing it here. And this greed, you're not using time to do the things you need to. So remember when we talked about those interplay of advantages, time, material, quality? This is a waste of time. 
It's a lot like the concept of why we say in chess, never bring your queen out early. Well, why? Because when she's attacked, she has to move. And when she's attacked again, she got to move to save her. You're wasting time. The more time you waste, the more the opponent can overwhelm you, then they take a material advantage, and then you end the deep doo-doo. So, after f4, bishop f5, he's already looking at some potential ideas. He could probably go to knight b4, maybe link up, go to c2. Some serious problems in the position. So, white goes, well, I'm going to make another pawn move because I've got to stop you from attacking me with the time that you picked up. And now, I really like this next move by him as well. I probably would play a5 here to stop the pawn from going to b4. He plays h5, and he wants to keep pushing that pawn to try to attack over here because, notice, the rook is now ushering this pawn forward to be able to attack. So, you know, tickle, tickle a bit. Now, white just ignores it. He's like, well, you know, I like bishops. I'm going to move my bishop to this open file. Pawn marches on. And after knight f3, this next move turns the advantage from white with his extra pawn to black's time is so valuable, the computer now goes black's better. h3. A critical move because if the bishop is still sitting there, he gets taken. So the bishop has to move, right? The only place for him to move is to go back home. So he literally moved the bishop and is now wasting a full move putting the bishop back. And black has momentum, so he's going to keep attacking. He stops your other pawn from moving. So it looks like for the price of a pawn, black is cheating. So really focus on the interplay of, of the advantages in chess here. B3. Well, he's trying to hold on to the pawn, but again, like, of the moves in the game, we're on move 10. Seven of white's moves have been pawn moves. Let that sink in. When you guys are making a lot of pawn moves, it's not good for your chess. Okay? You may be able to get away with it, but against a good player, you're done, son. Okay. Now, <clears throat> bishop c5. <coughs> Excuse me. And I have in my notes here, compare the development differences between the two players. Black already has the edge, according to the engine, and he's up a pawn. Even though when you count the material, white has the extra pawn, his lack of development and coordination, black is actually the one in the driver's seat here. And you'll see quickly, this game falls apart for white. Bishop b2, it's not exactly a threat. Black's getting all of his minor pieces into the game, and this guy, he couldn't go to his best square but he's got some ideas to be annoying and there's nothing white can really do about it so he goes e3 doesn't matter he's coming in tickle tickle on the lady you don't want to lose the queen check because the bishop supports the knight attacking the king and rook but i love this next one he's not in a hurry to grab the rook his bishop's currently being attacked. So we're going to bring another piece closer to the king, as well as set up discoveries. If this knight was to move right now to b3, that would win the queen via discovered check. Knight takes, bishop takes. And, I mean, it was quick, right? We, we saw the gradual transition. This was like pushing somebody down the hill. White like, looked like he was completely okay, and now his king can't castle. He's stuck in the middle. He's being viciously attacked. Like Black's minor pieces are swarming around his king. This is GG. Knight d2. He's trying to develop, trying to cover holes, but too little, too late. Bishop f2, cutting off key squares. The best White has is to give up the lady for two pieces. And now, this goes to our next principle. We have now taken our huge time advantage that we collected over time and turned it into a major material advantage with the queen versus the minor pieces. So when is a queen most powerful? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily an end game, but an end game implies there's not many pieces on the board. 
the more open the position is, the more options the queen has and the more powerful she becomes. Now, based off that logic, the end game, you're right. I need to force trades. When you're up material, if you force equal trades, the position gets easier to play and the more open it gets, your queen's going to be more powerful for hitting targets. So the next move, bishop d4, I'm saying I'm forcing the trade. If you move your bishop, I take your rook. If you don't trade bishops with me, I'm going to trade. Forcing trades. So we get that off the board, and now the only thing that's protecting the king is these pawns. So he tries to chip away at the pawns to open them up even more. Can you see the plan that's coming to fruition? So b4, now he wants to make his queen better. Queen has ideas to maneuver around different places. Could go anywhere on this diagonal, or could go here, which is a great square to attack more things, which he does. Now, again, flexibility. We're hitting the bishop. Nothing's defending the bishop, so he's got to defend. Now he's thinking about potentially coming here. If this knight ever moves, that falls, and we have a passer. Get another lady. So he attacks the queen. Now, in the opening, moving the queen over and over is bad. Let's hit an opening. We're probing for weaknesses. A lot of people get confused. They think moving the same piece over and over can be bad. Black's position hasn't gotten worse here. He's gradually just, you know, applying steady pressure until his opponent breaks. Rook c2. He finally castles on move 27, going long, getting a rook into the game while keeping his king safe. Bishop d1. Now, he could retreat with the queen, but I very much like what he did here. He traded advantages. He takes here and then takes here. So it's knight and rook versus two rooks. A knight is only a very strong piece when it has somewhere to post and it can't be kicked out. That's not going to be the case here. Also, with the open file being controlled by black, black's going to quickly be able to force a trade of rooks, and it's going to be rook versus knight. And you'll see the rook will quickly go take pawns as weaknesses, clear it out, and promote a pawn. So that's going to be the rest of the game, and that's the end game technique you use when trading down effectively. So rook d3, hitting the knight. Don't want to give him that pawn for free. We get our other rook involved, forcing the trade of rooks. Now I love this next move. Rook takes g3. Because if the pawn takes, we have a runner. There's nothing white can do to stop that h-pawn from running. Everybody see that? Yeah. So he decides not to take, but we go after the weakness anyway to take, clear it out, and make a new lady. And after rook g2, Mr. Schwartz decided to throw in the towel here and resign. But hopefully we got some key concepts from Mr. Albin with the Albin counter gambit and trading advantages in chess. We've been talking a lot about it and I like once we've gone through the first nine weeks to come back and hit you guys with more complex version of what we've already talked about. Seeing a master actually put this in motion, the things that we've discussed, maybe, maybe it jars something and you're like, huh, well that makes sense. Maybe I can give up material in order to get more time to attack, but you got to make your time count. So if you wait around too long, you're just down a pawn. That's called consolidating the position. All right, that's what I have for you for today.